Mm, hello, everyone. My name is Suyuan Niu. I'm a PhD student at the University of Montpellier. I'm really happy to be here to talk about enabling parallel program execution on this hardware. Before I start, let me thank Juding and uh, Henry for inviting me to the quantum computer system lecture series. So now let's start the talk. Here is the outline of my talk. First, I will give us a brief recap. I will talk about the progress and the perspectives of quantum computing. Second, I will introduce some NISC hardware limitations. Third, I will talk about the parallel program execution. I will introduce some applications of applying this technique on superconducting quantum hardware and quantum annealing. Finally, I will conclude my talk. So the first, transistors were, first transistor was born in Bell Lab in 1947. Since then, the classical computer has made huge, huge progress. According to the very famous Morse law, the number of transistors on a pr processor doubles every two years. We can see there are more, more and more transistors on a, on a processor. However, there is a limitation. We cannot reduce the size of the transistor forever. And also too many transistors on the processor can cause too much energy. So a new computing paradigm is needed. Quantum computing is one of the candidates for a new computing paradigm. The idea came from Richard Feynman in 1981. Here is the very famous quote. He said, nature isn't classical, damn it. And if you want to make a simulation of nature, you'd better make it quantum mechanical. So he proposed to simulate a quantum system using a quantum computer. So now people might ask, what kind of problems can be solved by a quantum computer efficiently? Here by efficiently, I mean the problem can be solved in polynomial time. Here is the relationship between different problems. The P problem means this problem can be solved by a classical computer in polynomial time. And P means this problem can be verified by a class classical computer in polynomial time. And NP complete means this problem cannot be solved by a, con by a conventional computer in polynomial time. PQP means the problem can be solved by a quantum computer in polynomial time. The interesting thing is, is that some problems are thought not to be in P, but in BQP. Here, the, this kind of problems can demonstrate some advantages if we use quantum computer to solve, solve them. One example is the short cell algorithm for integer factorization. It can, re, it can achieve exponential speed up compared to the classical algorithm. Another question is, does BQP include MP complete problem? Unfortunately, the answer is likely to be no. We cannot expect a quantum computer to solve the MP complete problem efficiently. And another problem is that too many qubits are required, for example, to implement the Schwarz algorithm. It is, it is believed to require millions of qubits to implement it. So where are we? What are the current status of quantum computing? Here is a figure from Rigetti Computing. Now we only have quantum computer with around 100 qubits. We are in the noisy intermediate scale quantum era. If we want to implement, let's say, Schwarz algorithm, we need a fault tolerant quantum device which requires millions of qubits. It is it is largely beyond the capability of near-term quantum devices. So now people might ask, what kind of potential advantages can be demonstrated in the NISC era? Here came the idea of variational quantum algorithms. The variational quantum eigensolver introduced in the last lecture is one of the most popular VQAs. 
Here is the structure of a VQA. First, we prepare some arbitrary angles and we build a per, 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 parametrized quantum circuit. And then we measure this circuit and send the measurement results to the classical computer. Here we have a cost function depending on which kind of problem you want to solve. There is a classical optimizer here. It can optimize the parameters. The updated parameters are sent back to the quantum computer. This loop is repeated for several times until a good enough solution is obtained. Here we can see a VQA is kind of a quantum heuristic, uh, heuristic algorithm. By heuristic, I mean it cannot guarantee to find the optimal solution. But this type of problem, this type of algorithm can alleviate the requirements for quantum hardware a lot. The key point is that the parametrized circuit only has shallow depth. It is much more easily to be implemented in the NISC hardware. Here are some popular VQAs and their applications. First is the variational quantum eigensolver, which is used to find the ground state energy of a molecule Hamiltonian. The second one is quantum approximate optimization algorithm to solve the combinatorial optimization problem. The third one is the variational quantum linear solver to solve the linear equations. And the fourth one is the variational quantum classifier for classification problems. Here is a GitHub repo that collects lots of VQAs. And if you're interested, I recommend you to check this repo. So now I have finished my recap about the, quant about the progress of quantum computing. And now I will talk about the limitations in the NISC era. As I mentioned before, we are now in the noisy intermediate scale quantum, quantum era. The NISC hardware has several limitations. First is the nearest neighbor connectivity. It ex exists on superconducting and silicon quantum dot device. Here is the, uh, I, the error map of IBM Q system Melbourne device. And this is the topology of the device. We can see the connectivity can only be realized between neighbor qubits. If we want to apply an entangled gate between Q0 and Q2, we cannot do it directly because there is no link between Q0 and Q2. We need to either, either swap Q0 and Q1 or we swap Q1 and Q2 to realize the connection between Q0 and Q2. The quantum circuits are designed without considering any hardware constraints. So if you want to execute a circuit on the superconducting device, you need to modify the circuit. For example, you insert some swap gates to make all the two qub qubit operations satisfy the connectivity. It is called the qubit mapping problem. I think you've heard about it in the second lecture. The second limitation are the noisy quantum operations, including the readout error, one qubit error, and two qubit error. Here we can see these blocks represent the readout error of the qubits. And these two error bars, uh, one is for H error rate, and the other one is for C0 error rate. It's important to note that the gate, the gate error is different across qubits. We can see each block has different length, which means the readout error is different for each qubit. And also each link has different color, which also represents the different C0 error rates. We cannot treat them equally. Due to these hardware limitations, only small circuits with shallow depth can be executed on the hardware to get reliable results. Let's say we execute a five qubit circuit on this 65 qubit chip. The hardware utilization is only 8%. Most of the qubits are wasted during the execution process. 
And also as quantum computing becomes more and more popular, there is a growing demand to access quantum hardware, which leads to a long waiting time for the users to retrieve the results. For example, at the time when I submit the job, there are more than 1,000 jobs pending on the device. And this device is an IBM quantum, is an IBM private chip. The situation can become even crowded, more crowded for IBM public quantum chip. So here comes a very timely issue. How do we use quantum hardware more efficiently while maintaining the output fidelity? The parallel program execution was proposed to address this problem. Here is an example. First, we run a four qubit circuit on this 10 qubit chip. The hardware usage is only 40%. But if we run two circuits on this chip simultaneously, the hardware usage becomes 80%. So the key idea is to execute multiple programs on the quantum chip simultaneously. It has already been demonstrated on IBM superconducting quantum hardware and D-Wave annealing machine. It can improve the hardware usage and reduce the total program runtime. So here I will discuss the design challenges for parallel program execution on superconducting quantum hardware. Here I list three challenges. First is to find reliable partitions for each circuit. If we want to execute multiple circuits in parallel, of course, we can just combine them together and run a big circuit on this hardware. However, the results are not very good. The fidelities of the circuits are, are decreased a lot. One reason is that it's usually very complicated to find the optimal ma initial mapping for a large, large quantum circuit. Instead, it's better to find reliable partitions on the quantum hardware and allocate these partitions to each circuit. However, the number of, lim the number of reliable qubits is limited on the NISC hardware and they are sparsely distributed so it's difficult to find reliable partitions for all the circuits. The second challenge is to mitigate crosstalk impact. If several quantum operations are executed in parallel, they might introduce crosstalk and, and the crosstalk can decrease the circuit fidelity. If we execute many quantum circuits in parallel, it's more likely to have parallel operations so the crosstalk impact might be increased. The third challenge is to trade off between the hardware utilization and circuit fidelity. Of course, we want to execute as many circuits as possible in parallel on this quantum hardware to fully utilize it. However, as I mentioned before, the number of reliable qubits is limited. If we run too many circuits in parallel, the circuit the circuit fidelity will be decreased significantly. So we need to balance between the hardware utilization and circuit fidelity. I will explain each challenge in detail in the following slides. If you want to find a reliable partition for a circuit, you need to find a reliable subset of, uh, of the hardware. So, um, so first you need to check the connectivity of the subset. For example, for this subset, you can use graph diameter to check the connectivity. So first you can find the shortest path from, the, from one vertex to the other one. For example, the shortest path from Q0 to Q3 is three, and the shortest path from Q0 to Q2 is two. And then you can find the longest one among this shortest path. And this is the graph di diameter, which is also called the longest shortest path. It's, of course, there are some other metrics to check the connectivity of the subset. Here is just an example. You also need to check the error rates of the subset, including the readout error rate, one qubit error rate, and two qubit error rate. 
The number of gate operations of the circuit is also very important. If you have a large number of two qubit gate, you might want to consider it more when you decide the reliability of the partition. Third, you need to take care of the interaction cross circuits. So you need to mitigate crosstalk, as I mentioned before. And also you need to find, and it's very tricky to find a globally good solution for all the circuits. Sometimes you might want to sacrifice the, uh, re sacrifice the reliability of one partition in order to find the global optimal solution for all the partitions. Here is just an example of a good candidate for reliable partition. It is, um, it is densely connected and it has low error rates. The second challenge is to mitigate crosstalk introduced by the parallel program execution. First, I want to introduce crosstalk. I categorize it into two types. One is local crosstalk and the other one is global crosstalk. For local crosstalk, it means the crosstalk exists within the two qubit quantum system, like here. So first it comes from the always on ZZ interaction between qubits. For transmon qubits, if you want to couple two qubits, like uh, independent, indicated by the link here, there is an um, always on ZZ interaction between the qubits. It is related to the coupling pa parameter. This always on ZZ interaction is particularly severe for IBM quantum uh, device because they have fixed frequency transmon qubits. For the tunable qubits or tunable couplers, you might uh, be able to reduce this always on ZZ interaction. The local crosstalk can also come from two qubit gate. If the if you build a two qubit gate for quantum hardware, the Hamiltonian of the two qubit gate will include some unwanted interactions, and these terms we call it driven crosstalk. For global crosstalk. It means the impact of the crosstalk go beyond the two qubit uh, system. So first, it also comes from the always on ZZ interaction because here Q1 is not only coupled with Q0, it also, couple, it also couples with Q2 and Q3. So here there are also some always on ZZ interaction. And second, the global crosstalk comes from the simultaneous gate operations like here. If the gate operations are executed at the same time, they, will, they might introduce crosstalk to each other and decrease the circuit fidelity. In the following slides, I mainly focus on this case, but there are some other approaches to reduce the cross, other types of crosstalk and you can easily find them in the literature. So now you, I have introduced crosstalk. So now I want to talk about how to characterize crosstalk. Um, generally, we use the protocol called simultaneous randomized benchmarking to characterize crosstalk. It can quantify the impact of parallel instructions. First, let me explain what is randomized benchmarking. Suppose we want want to perform RB on two qubits. First, we prepare a sequence of random Clifford gates as indicated by C1 here. Clifford gates can be simulated by a classical computer efficiently so we can find the inverse of the gates. Uh, this symbol means the inverse, the inverse, gates, the inverse of these gates. So we first apply some Clifford gates and then we apply the inverse of this gates. So this gates will cancel canceled out with each other and we will end up obtaining the mm, initial state again. However, we know that the gate is not perfect. There are some errors. So when we measure the circuit, um, the probability of obtaining the initial state is not 
for example, you might obtain 95% of state 00 and 5% 5, 5 of state 011011. Then you increase the number of cleaver gates, and again, you apply the inverse of this gates. The, the probability of obtaining the initial state is decreased due to the accumulating errors here. And here are the results. The x-axis is the uh, Clifford length and the y-axis is the ground state population. We can see the probability of obtaining the initial state is decreased as the increase of the number of Clifford gates. And we can put these data points to a feeder function and the feeder function can calculate the average error rate of the Clifford gate. There is a relationship between the average uh, between the gate error between the Clifford gate error and two qubit gate error. So you can also calculate the average two qubit gate error using randomized benchmarking. This method is very popular because it is scalable and is insensitive to state preparation and measurement errors. However, it only gives the average level of error. We cannot know more details. For simultaneous randomized benchmarking, here is an example. First, we perform randomized benchmarking uh, individually on Q1 and Q2. And then we perform simultaneous randomized benchmarking. When we perform the uh, randomized benchmarking individually, we can obtain the independent error rate. And then when we apply them simultaneously, we can obtain the correlated error rate. If the correlated gate error is larger than the independent one, it means crosstalk exists between the two qubits. Here is an example. Again, the x-axis is the number of Clifford gates. The y-axis is the probability of obtaining the initial states. The red curve is the results when we perform this independent randomized benchmarking. And the blue curve is the result when we perform simultaneous randomized benchmarking. We can see the blue curve decays much faster than the red curve, which means crosstalk exists between Q1 and Q2. So now I want to perform simultaneous randomized benchmarking on this IBM Q7 Casablanca device. Many papers have shown that the crosstalk is only significant between parallel two qubit operations. So here I only focus on this and ignore the crosstalk that comes from the simultaneous single qubit gates. Here are the results. The x axis is C naught i and y axis is C naught j. And the numbers here shows the ratio of the correlated error to the independent error. If the ratio is larger than one, it means crosstalk exists. And note that as simultaneous randomized benchmarking is only performed on CNOS that can be executed in parallel, it means they cannot share any qubits. That's the reason why we have some blank spots here. From the results, we can see there is a high crosstalk between these two qubit pairs. If we perform simultaneous randomized benchmarking, as I mentioned, we need to first perform randomized benchmarking on each qubit pair and then perform simultaneous randomized benchmarking again. It, it introduces a large overhead of circuit executions. Also, if you have a very large quantum hardware and you want to perform SRB on each QB pair, there will be a very large overhead. Therefore, this paper introduces, introduced some optimizations to reduce the overhead. First, the Experimental results show that the crosstalk is only significant for qubit pairs that are separated by one hop distance, like shown here. So we only characterize these one hop pairs. 
it can reduce the uh, number of pairs significantly. And second, we can parallelize SRB experiments of multiple qubit pa pairs. Here is an example, we can perform these three SRB at the same time. And uh, from the experimental results, we found that the crosstalk is quite stable. It does not vary a lot across days. So at the beginning, we can characterize, uh, SR, perform SRB on these pairs for the complete quantum hardware. And we pick the pairs that have high crosstalk. And then we can only characterize these high crosstalk pairs. Using these three optimization methods, uh, it is uh, le less expensive to perform SRB on the whole quantum device. Here I want to show the crosstalk impact on parallel program execution. And let's see, we execute two circuits on this quantum chip and we allocate two partitions First, the two partitions are not adjacent from each other, so there is no crosstalk. And then we fix the partition P3 and move the other partition to make it next to P3. So crosstalk exists between P2 and P3. And here are the results. The y-axis is the fidelity of the circuit. This is the result. The result of the circuit when it is executed on P3 independently, there is no parallel circuit execution. And this is the result uh, of the circuit on P3 when two circuits are executed on P2 and P3 simultaneously. Here we can see the fidelity of P3 is decreased by 23% due to crosstalk. The same for P2. The, the fidelity is decreased by 37% for simultaneous executions compared with the independent execution. This example shows the great impact of crosstalk on, multi, on the parallel program execution. So how to mitigate crosstalk impact? First, we can mitigate it at the partition level we can simply avoid adjacent partitions like shown here. Uh, they are more than one hop distance away from each other, so there is no additional crosstalk. Second, you can mitigate crosstalk at the circuit, circuit level by designing some clever scheduling methods. Here is an example. Suppose high crosstalk exists between the two qubits. We can the two, two gates. We can insert a barrier here to make these two gates executed serially. However, it will, mm, it will increase the idle time between the two gates, so, addish, so additional decoherence error is introduced. Instead, you can insert the barrier in this way, so no crosstalk and no additional decoherence error is uh, added. The tricky part here is to trade off between the crosstalk and decoherence error. There are some other scheduling methods, and here's just an example. The third challenge is to trade off between the hardware usage and the circuit fidelity. We want to run many circuits in parallel, but we do not want to decrease the circuit fidelity a lot. If the fidelity loss is significant, we might we need to, to reduce the number of simultaneous circuits or we just run the circuits independently. Here is a workflow to trade off between the two factors. Again, this is just an example. So given multiple programs, you can first partition for each circuit individually, and then you can partition for this circuit simultaneously. After obtaining the partitions, you can estimate the circuit fidelity based on the partition uh, in terms of the error rates and also the gate number of the circuits. You want to estimate the circuit rather than execute it on the quantum hardware. 
And then there is a fidelity difference between the independent execution and the simultaneous execution. If there are too much difference, you need to reduce the number of simultaneous circuits or you, you make them execute independently. Otherwise, you just go for the parallel program execution. But here, how much tolerance can we, uh, how can we tolerate this um, difference between the two, two execution methods is still an open question. Here are some math, here are some papers that talk about the parallel program execution and they have different methods. I recommend you to check them if you're interested. So now I will show some applications of applying parallel program, program execution on superconducting quantum device and quantum annealing machine. So the first one is to apply parallel program execution to VQE to reduce the number of measurement circuits. Here is the workflow of VQE and the, in the measurement process, this is where parallel program execution can help. Suppose we have a Hamiltonian that is composed of four Pauli terms, ZI, IZ, XX, and YY. If you want to calculate the expectation value of this Hamiltonian, you need to sum the expectation value of these terms together and this means you need to measure the circuit on this basis. In the quantum computer, you can only measure it in the Z basis, which has two eigen, eigen vectors, which is state one and state zero. If you want to measure it on Y basis or X basis, you need to insert some additional single qubit gates here so that the measurement, uh, the output state will be in one of the eigenstate of the original uh, basis. In this case, we need three measurement circuits to calculate the expectation value once. One circuit for ZI and IZ, because they commute with each other, they can be measured simultaneously. And one circuit for XX and one circuit for YY. This introduces a large overhead of the measurement circuits. We can reduce this overhead by just execute them together in parallel. The other application of VQE is the entanglement forging. It's, it's, it is a new paper published by IBM this year. The idea is to just is to simulate a quantum system using only half as many qubits on quantum computer. So it has a 10 qubit Hamiltonian and it casts the, ham, cuts the Hamiltonian into two, casts the quantum circuit into two five qubit circuits with some classical post processing. And this method will um, need more circuit executions. And here, to reduce this overhead, they perform pairs VQE on two partitions of the quantum hardware simultaneously to reduce uh, to save time. And we can also apply parallel program execution on zero noise extrapolation. This is a widely used error mitigation method. It contains two steps. One is noise scaling given a quantum circuit we can extend the we can extend the quantum quantum circuit by uh, increasing its depth we can insert some additional gates to the circuit and then the inverse case of this additional gates because we want to make sure that the extended circuit um, keep the same functionality as the initial one so the noise is scaled as we increase in the depth of the circuit. Here is an example. Um, suppose the expectation, ideal expectation value of the problem is one. And in, at the beginning, we execute the initial circuit and we obtain the expectation value around 0.6. And then we scale the 
uh, we scale the length of the circuit with noise scale factor of 1.5, 2, and 2.5. We collect these data points and then we use on some extrapolation methods to extrapolate the noise free expectation value. That's the idea of zero noise extrapolation. The limitation of this method is that we need to execute the cer several circuits to realize the error mitigation. So the idea here is that we can run these circuits with different depths in parallel to just realize error mitigation in one big circuit. Even though different partitions have different error rates, the experimental results show that there are some similarities inside of the partition so that the it can still it can still realize error mitigation by applying um, parallel program execution to the zero noise extrapolation. And here I want to um, I want to explain how the application of applying parallel program execution in quantum annealing device. So the goal of quantum annealing is to find the global minimum of a combinatorial optimization problem. The Hamiltonian, the, the Hamiltonian is composed, the system Hamiltonian is composed of two parts. The first one is the initial Hamiltonian and the second one is the problem Hamiltonian. The initial Hamiltonian is prepared in the superposition states, which is the ground state of this Hamiltonian. At the very beginning, the system Hamiltonian is equal to the initial Hamiltonian and then uh, and it is in the ground state. And then the annealing process begins. So the we increase the weights of the problem Hamiltonian and decrease the weights of the initial Hamiltonian. The annealing process is slowly enough so that um, so that we can keep uh, in keep being in the ground state. So finally, the system Hamiltonian will be equal to the problem Hamiltonian and we can obtain the ground state of this problem Hamiltonian. That's the idea of quantum annealing. And D-Wave wave machine implements quantum annealing on its hardware. Here is the data sheet of D-Wave machines. We can see it, uh, one is the two, 2000 qubit, 2000 Q machine, and the other one is the advantage machine. We can see uh, they have a large number of qubits, more than 2000 for this chip and more than 5000 for this chip. And the other interesting thing is that it also has limited connectivity, just like in the superconducting quantum, quantum device. So if we want to map a cubal problem on the wave machine, we need to find the minor embedding for the cubal problem. It is very similar to the qubit mapping process for superconducting quantum device. Here in this paper, they realized to execute 12 cubal problems on this device simultaneously and 68 cubal problems on this advantage machine at the same time. They really improved the hardware usage a lot. To conclude, the parallel program execution can help improve the hardware usage and reduce the time for solving problems. It can be useful for superconducting quantum hardware, for example, in VQE algorithm or in zero noise extrapolation. And second, um, it, can also, um, it can also be useful for quantum annealing by solving multiple cubal problems at the same time. Mm, thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. And that's it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, if there has any questions from the audience, uh, please click the hands up.
I have a quick question. Yes. Okay. So like um, you meant, you talked about the crosstalk between like operation operational gates. So um, what about the crosstalk between measurements and uh, and gates? You know, if like you have multiple programs on the same um, uh, quantum computer. If you measure one bit, will it affect the operation on another qubit? Um, yes, uh, there is also a measurement crosstalk between the qubits, but here I didn't, uh, actually I didn't consider it, but yes, it exists. So like, is it like uh, more um, than the gate uh, crosstalk or is it less than the gate crosstalk? Mm, I'm not sure because I didn't check the number of it. I guess the crosstalk between gates is more severe, but it's just my guess. I suggest that you might want to check the numbers later. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there's no questions from audience. So, so I have a question on yeah. uh, page 25. Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, I guess, right, the, the, the bottom figure is from Morales' paper. So, uh, so is this like, um, could you elaborate more like the, the partition level and circuit level, the difference? Mm, yes. Um, I think the, uh, in partition level, you can just, there is, you can ensure that there is no more crosstalk introduced by the parallel program execution. Mm -hmm. But if you just mitigate uh, in the at the circuit level, uh, so maybe the two, um, uh, and uh, also in the partition level, you will not have the probability of introducing more decoherence error because you don't need to insert barriers. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. Got Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, uh, I think I have a like a kind of naive or like general question about all like the, this techniques that you talk about. Like, for example, how you kind of mitigate the like the error of the crosstalk in general. So is it kind is it kind of like at the compiler level where like it will like change automatically depending on the circuit, uh, and like will it be able to kind of like be applied to different type of the like QB alignment or is this kind of like currently as it stands is a more specific um, algorithm uh, that works for certain type of like QB alignment in the uh, in the hardware level as well as only uh, like applicable to certain type of the uh, like the circuits. Mm, it is in the compilation level. So uh, I don't think it is specific for a certain types of circuits. So for any type of circuit you can compile, when you compile the circuits, you might introduce more circuits to execute them in parallel. So I think the general framework. Mm 